Good morning, this is Robert Jones. Transmitting to you from a secret location in the extreme northeastern corner of Rome, Georgia. Today we're going to continue our discussion on the Book of Revelation, at least in the first 30 minutes. And then uh, Elder Ed will uh, have a message for us in the second uh, 30 second or 30 minutes. Um, where we are in the course, we're all the way there at the bottom in the chapter study. And we probably have you know, two, three weeks left uh, on that. Today we'll be doing some of the more interesting uh, chapters in the book of Revelation, I think. Chapter 12 and chapter 13, maybe a little more. We'll also look at the use of the word uh, antichrist and false prophet in the Bible. So that's always kind of fun. And not something that you're typically going to find in your uh, typical church. So let's uh, get started on chapter 12. Now, chapter 12 uh, is quite fascinating. It's probably not part of the linear sequence timeline. So we've talked about the fact that uh, if you view uh, Revelation from a futurist viewpoint, that there is a sequence of events that that happen in a certain order. This may or may not be part of that linear sequence. I think the fall of Satan from heaven happened long ago, uh, and it's not something that's uh, going to happen as part of the uh, apocalypse and Armageddon. However, uh, that may or may not be. So what does chapter 12 describe? It describes a battle in heaven between the archangel Michael and Satan and could refer to Satan's original fall from heaven, which may or may not be described in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. And I think we can probably do a little reading here. Michael traditionally in the church has been viewed as the, the warrior archangel the one that takes on uh, Satan. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon, with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. His tail swept a third of the stars out of heaven, and flung them down to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. So the reference to the woman who's about to give birth, sometimes interpreted as uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and sometimes uh, interpreted as a metaphor for Israel or all of humankind, Adam and Adama. Satan, who was defeated in battle with Michael, may have taken a third of the angels with him in his fall. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Uh, Revelation 12.9 explicitly connects Satan with that ancient serpent called the devil. Genesis itself never explicitly states that the serpent in the Garden uh, of Eden is Satan. Uh, here we do have that identification. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. 
For the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They do not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and to the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. When a dragon saw that he had been hurled to earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert where she would be taken care of for a time, times and a half, out of the serpent's reach. Then from his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with a torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Well, that sort of sets the stage for what's happening now and what was happening a thousand years ago and what was happening 2,000 years ago. Satan's been kicked out of heaven because he's a bum. Uh, Michael has defeated him in battle. Uh, Satan and his minions have come down to earth. They're really angry, and so they're going to do whatever they can to mess things up here on earth. We're told that Satan is overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the testimony of the brothers that were accused by Satan. Satan in Hebrew can be translated as accuser. Satan is filled with fury because of his fall from heaven. You know, try to take it out on, well, us, the offspring of the woman. Chapter 12 appears to be background material for the rise of Satan against God described in chapter 13 and prefigured in chapter 11. I think maybe it would be useful to look at one of the Old Testament descriptions Like Ezekiel 28 or Isaiah. Here's Isaiah 14. Isaiah is a really long road. So we oftentimes say that there's a description of Satan's fall in the Old Testament. But it's not as clear cut as perhaps we would like it to be. So here's one of the possibilities, starting with verse 12 in Isaiah 14. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the most utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. But you were brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. Those who see you stare at you, they ponder your fate. Is this the man who shook the earth and made kingdoms tremble? The man who made the world a desert, who overthrew its cities and would not let his captives go home? All the kings of the nations lie in state, each in his own tomb. But you were cast out of your tomb like a rejected branch. You were covered with the slain, with those pierced by the sword, those who descended the stones of the pit, like a corpse trampled underfoot. You will not join them in burial, for you have destroyed your land and killed your people. The offspring of the wicked will never be mentioned again. So that's pretty strong language. And we think it probably is referring to uh, Satan. But it doesn't actually say that. It doesn't jump up and down and say, okay, so this next section is all about Satan. Now we have Ezekiel 28. 
It too is not clear as a bell. Uh, Ezekiel 28, 12 to 19. Um, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre and say to him, this is what the sovereign Lord says. You were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you, ruby, topaz, emerald, chrysolite, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day that you were created. Uh, till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence, and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God, and I expelled you, O guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom. Because of your splendor, so I threw you to earth, and I made a spectacle of you before kings. By your many sins and dishonest trade, you have desecrated your sanctuaries. So I made a fire come out from you, and it consumed you, and I reduced you to ashes on the ground, in the sight of all who were watching. All the nations who knew you were appalled at you. You have uh, come to horrible end and will be no more. Again, very strong language. And here, if this is referring to Satan, uh, then we know that he was a guardian cherub of God. Which sounds pretty uh, pretty exciting. However, how do we know this is about Satan? Well, it starts out, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre and say to him. Well, so I guess if you want to take this literally, it's about the king of Tyre. And, uh, well, gosh, was he really that evil? And was the king of Tyre a... a, a guardian cherub of the Lord God Almighty. So I think it's reasonable to guess that this might be about uh, Satan. And if it is, it and the passage we just read in Isaiah, they link up pretty closely with uh, chapter 12 in the book of Revelation. Okay, we move to chapter 13, which is maybe the most chilling chapter in uh, Revelation, but maybe the most chilling chapter in all of the Bible. Here we find out about the rise of Satan and his minions. He's uh, Satan's been thrown from heaven, or maybe he was a guardian cherub, and he's thrown down to earth. And now we find out how he's going to arrange his troops in battle against us. So it's the rise of Satan and his minions. There's a beast from the earth. We typically refer to this as the Antichrist, although the term doesn't actually appear in Revelation. And he's going to be a political leader. And then there's a beast from the sea, which we often refer to as the false prophet a religious or spiritual leader. So these human minions uh, are going to help uh, Satan in his rise. And uh, be sure that these are arrayed against us. So let's take a look at the verses, uh, and then uh, we'll look at the word Antichrist. Because, like I said, it doesn't appear anywhere in uh, Revelation. And the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. And I saw a beast coming out of the sea. He had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on his horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but he had feet like those of a bear and mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. So they come from Satan. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was astonished and followed the beast. 
Men worshipped a dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and exercise his authority for 42 months. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. Sounds like globalism to me. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the book of life, belonging to the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. He who has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity he will go. If anyone is to be killed with a sword, with a sword he will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. So that's the beast out of the sea. The one is probably a, a politician. Shocking that it would be a politician who would lead us all astray. And then the second part of 13, perhaps the most chilling. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. He exercised all the authority of the first beast on his behalf. It made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose fatal wound had been healed. And he performed great and miraculous signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth into full view of men. Because of the signs he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. He ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. He was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that it could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. He also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead, so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark. Which is the name of the beast, or the number of his name? This calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it is man's number. His number is 666. Wow. So we have two beasts. One from the sea, one from the earth. One's probably a political leader that we refer to as the Antichrist. One is probably a religious or spiritual leader that we refer to as the false prophet. So, The word Antichrist does appear in the Bible. Uh, in the Bible. 1 John 2, 18 and 19, it's used to describe uh, apostate Christians, those who once believed but no longer do. Uh, da, 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 da. Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. Apostate Christians. First John 2.22, same chapter. Who is the liar? It is the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is the antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. And then 1 John 4, 2-3. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does, does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the Spirit of the Antichrist which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in this world. And then 2 John 7. Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver 
and the Antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. So in John, you get the impression that uh, Antichrist is a term you would apply to any apostate Christian, to anyone who denies Christ's divinity, uh, any deceivers who deny uh, Christ that he, he even came to this world. So it's kind of a, a corporate thing as the Antichrist, not so much uh, referring to a specific individual. But the concept of the Antichrist as a individual does indeed exist uh, in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Daniel. So Daniel 7, 7, for example, says, After that in my vision at night I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. Well, that sounds a lot like the beast described in Revelation. Uh, Daniel 7, 19 to 27. Then I wanted uh, to know the true meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others and most terrifying. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up before which three of them fell. The horn that looked more imposing than the others and that had eyes and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I watched, his horn was waging war against the saints and defeating them until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the saints of the Most High. That's us. And the time came when they possessed the kingdom. He gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are the ten kings who will come from this kingdom. And after them, another king will arise different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his saints and try to change the set times and the laws. The saints will be handed over to him for a time, times, and time and a half. But the court will sit and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven will be handed over to the saints, the people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and the rulers will worship and obey him. Uh, Daniel eight twenty three to 25. In the latter part of their reign, when rebels have become completely wicked, a stern-faced king, a master of intrigue, will arise. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy the mighty men and the holy people. He will cause deceit to prosper and he will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes. Yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. Daniel 11, 31 to 32. Desecration of the temple. His armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. Then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. With flattery, he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant, but the people who know their God will firmly resist him. So there we have the reference to the abomination that causes desolation. Now, this may be in reference to a, a human king, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth. Do I have that right? The fourth? Anyway, it's Antiochus Epiphanes from uh, Syria. But it also seems to have the bigger meaning of the, of the Antichrist. Uh, Daniel 11, 36 to 39, the king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god, and he will say unheard of things against the god of gods. 
He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed, for what has been determined must take place. He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the one desired by women, nor will he regard any god, but will exalt himself above them all. Instead of them, he will honor a god of fortresses, a god unknown to his father. He will honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He will attack the mightiest fortress with the help of a foreign god and will greatly honor those who acknowledge him. He will make them rulers over many people and will distribute the land at a price. The abomination that causes desolation. Uh, we already mentioned the reference in 11 to 31, also in Daniel 9, 27, and in Matthew 24, 15. And then in Revelation 13, 1 to 10, the beast from the sea, power invested by the dragon, uh, who is Satan. So that's uh, that's the Antichrist. We also have a concept of a false prophet. First uh, John two you see John was right on this stuff. Eighteen to nineteen and twenty two. The life appeared, we have seen it, testified to it. We proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father who has appeared to us. And I did that wrong. I wanted eighteen and nineteen from chapter two. Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Even now many antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us. They did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going out uh, showed that none of them belonged to us. 1 John 4, 3. We'll start with 2. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges Jesus Christ has come in the flesh from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is in this word, and is, is in this world. Uh, we'll do a Second Thessalonians, uh, which many people think is the most uh, flagrant mention of the false prophet. Second Thessalonians 2, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He opposes and exalts himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, and even sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles and signs and wonders. And every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie 
and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. So next time we get together, we'll talk about the uh, the number of the beast, which is 666. And we'll talk about what that means. And then we will continue on with chapter 13.